Okay. And just an FYI, when we get to our survivor story, and here we're um, admitting our survivor, Suli Chankin, right now, um, she has a film about her life. We are not able to record that. So we will be uh, probably stopping the recording at that point. But we want to say welcome and thank you for coming. We know that you're busy and you've had a lot of stress and just, just a, a different kind of a school year. And we're all here to support you and to um, help as you work with your students in very difficult times, very difficult situations. Um, and so we're just, we're just thankful that, that you um, trust us to help you um, to be a part of that, to help with resources, to help in ways that, that we can help you as you teach your children. Um, so this is part two of Remember, Reflect and Respond. Uh, we had our first part in September and so we're kind of um, finalizing things tonight, talking about high quality Holocaust education and maybe some impediments that, that could come up with this history and teaching this. Um, and Dr. Uh, Orbelding is gonna be uh, speaking to that. And then we've got um, um, more experts from the museum and as we get to them, we'll, we'll introduce them. Lori, would you like to welcome everyone? I'd be delighted to. Hi, my name is Laurie Schaefer, and um, Karen and I have uh, worked together to create um, a program for you that I think you're really going to enjoy tonight and um, and learn a lot from. There's so many varied experiences that, that we have for you, um, <clears throat> and I'm really appreciative of all the teachers who are joining. Having just taught a full day myself today, um, I was uh, really looking forward to tonight and hope this will rejuvenate you and your um, <clears throat> desire to teach about this particular subject as we equip you for that particular endeavor. So I'm going to turn it back over to Karen and um, get going with our program. So our program is in partnership with the um, Holocaust Museum's Czech program, the Conference for Holocaust Education Centers across the United States. Um, we have the director of that program here with us, Christina Chavaria. And if you would like to say a few words, Christina. Sure, I'd love to. Um, I, I know uh, we met many of you uh, a month ago when you attended the first part of this program. And I, I wanted to say that um, Karen and Lori and Lee and Juanita and Tali and members of the council have been friends of the museum for several years. So we're, we're, not, we're not only colleagues in this, but as I said, we are friends. And what we do through the Czech program is we work closely with Holocaust organizations across the United States to, to help them to consider what their goals are for teacher professional development and to consider the USHMM's resources and content and how to integrate them so that every organization that works with us can meet its, its goals for teacher professional development. And all of, all of our partners um, have been really crucial to us in this year, in this year and a half since the pandemic began um, because it's really helped us to, to move forward to listen to them, um, to hear their insights. And so this evening, even though this is the second part in the end of, of this two-part workshop, it's really only the beginning of a new relationship and a, and a continued relationship with the North Carolina Council. So expect to um, hopefully see more of us working mm -hmm. with you, with our friends in the council and just know that we are incredibly grateful to each and every one of you, all of the educators here, because we cannot fathom what you have gone through in the last year and a half and what, what is still ongoing um, and the challenges that you face in this climate. Um, so thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, we're really, really grateful for you. And thank you for this opportunity to have us here. Karen and Lori and Lee and all of the council. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. We're gonna go ahead and start with um, our new segment called Ask a Historian. <laughs> and we're excited to have Dr. Obelding with us 
Um, we ask that you submit questions and if you didn't get around to it, that's fine. I'm sure she'll be able to do that. Um, we'll be able to take those questions now, but you know, there are lots of myths. There's lots of misinformation out there about the Holocaust. Um, there's a lot coming at students, coming at teachers from various points. Um, how do we break that down? How do we help dispel some of the myths? Where, where our goal is high quality Holocaust education. What does that look like? Um, and, and how can us being able to um, break down some of these myths? How do we talk to our students about it? This is something that we are hoping um, our expert panels will, panelists will be able to help us with tonight. So without further ado, Dr. Belding. Yeah, um, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Karen and Lori and everybody on the North Carolina Council and all of my colleagues who are here today. I, I wanna make it clear that I am a historian. And so my knowledge base is, is the history of this period, particularly American response. And so some of the questions that have come in have been also about pedagogy and about kind of these broader questions. And so if any of the resources that I share, if I miss one that you know about that you think could be really helpful, I mean, our goal tonight is to be as helpful to you as possible. So feel free to unmute yourself and chime in if there's something that I miss. And also, you know, we have five or six questions here in the docket already, but we have time for more. And so if something comes up for you, feel free to stick it in the chat, which I'll be monitoring or the Q&A function, whichever, whichever one shows up on this platform. Um, this is a small group. And so we can be as chatty as, as we want to be tonight. Um, so the first question that came in in advance was, how could things have been different in Germany if people had not been as willing to mistreat Jewish people? I'm curious if there's a practical way to prevent misinformation of people leading to genocide in today's society, which is a great question. Um, the problem is that historians hate hypotheticals. And so the, if I can't cite anything, I just feel like I'm guessing. And so, so the first part of the question about how could things have been different, um, we don't know. We don't know what one thing could have changed everything. Um, what we can do is look at the history of the rise of the Nazi party in Germany, um, how and why and when they gained followers, who those followers were, um, how people in power made choices to tolerate Nan uh, Nazi anti-Semitism in exchange for staying in power or for gaining votes. Um, it's really about choices all along the political spectrum and from every level of German society. And any one of those choices made in a different way could have mitigated or prevented the Holocaust. Um, that is not a satisfying answer because we want to say, well, there's this one thing that could have been different. And unfortunately, we don't necessarily know that. What we know now from studying the Holocaust and from studying other genocides, um, both before and after the Holocaust, is that there are warning signs. There are warning signs of genocide. There are warning signs of mass atrocities. Um, and the museum actually has a, an early warning project um, centered in our Center for the Prevention of Genocide that advises policymakers on the areas of the world where the threat of genocide is acute. I was going to put things in the chat, but so that you don't have to look at me for a whole 40 minutes, I'll share my screen and share some of the, um, some of the links and I'll also put them in the chat. So here you should be able to see um, the museum's page of frequently asked questions about the Holocaust. I'll put this link in the chat. Um, this is a great place to go. This is a side note, but this is a great place to go if your students have kind of general questions about what is the Holocaust, how and why did it happen? Why the Jews? Why didn't the Jews just leave? Um, this is a great place to go. This is based in the Holocaust Encyclopedia. There are lots of links embedded therein to different Holocaust Encyclopedia articles. Um, and you can see some of the questions are, you know, did Hitler brainwash people, which is a common question students ask. So this is kind of your general myths and misconceptions site to go to. But in terms of the early warning sign project, let me pull the link um, here and I will put it in the chat and also show you what that page looks like. So you can learn more about that early warning signs project here. It is fairly long and technical because the point of the museum's early warning signs project is to advise policymakers. And so you see, you know, there's a statistical risk assessment 
but it shows, you know, ongoing mass killing, battle related deaths, coup attempts, freedom of religion, political killing. This is probably a little too high level for a lot of students um, when you're looking at this sort of thing. And so the museum also devised a few years ago, a poster set of early warning signs, which I'm also putting in the chat here and going to show you here. Um, this is something that is downloadable, printable. You can put it up in your classroom if this come if this issue comes up of how do we go about preventing genocide? What were some of the signs and steps towards genocide in Nazi Germany? Um, you can see that some of the the examples are territorial expansion, and then the spread of discrimination with examples, with personal stories, with pictures. Um, responses from the international community, um, a timeline at the bottom where you can see some of the different steps that were involved in this specific um, instance, systematic persecution, legal persecution, discrimination, um, economic and legal expulsion. So these are some of the steps that we've identified and that scholars have identified as early warning signs when you're tracking a genocide that has happened or the likelihood of a genocide occurring in the future. So the second part of the question was, I'm curious if there's a practical way to prevent mistreatment of people leading to genocide in today's society. Um, some of the warning signs here listed on both parts of the project on either the early warning signs project or the in the poster set that we've used for students um, include some of the same things. So being mindful when you see some of those same signs emerging, when you're reading the news, when you're hearing about things that are happening overseas, um, and then reaching out to elected officials to let them know that, that you feel like the US government should keep an eye on that situation. That is a very practical step that we could all do to, to hopefully prevent or, or mitigate a genocide. Write a letter to the newspaper, call people's attention to it, let, th let them know that you're watching and that this is something that you care about. Um, I don't know if any of my, my colleagues feel like I'm missing anything or if they wanna chime in on anything. And if not, I'll move on to the next question. No, Becky, this is um, yeah. super hey. helpful. And I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, I, I was just thinking too, that we do have some resources um, from our Days of Remembrance um, mm -hmm. kit that we have online and we can post that link. There is, there is also a video that looks at the warning signs from 1938. Yeah, that's probably from the same 2014 poster set that I found. I think right. that was probably our theme that year. And so if you can find that, I would love if you can okay. post that in the chat. I'll do that. Thanks. Um, yeah, it, a lot of our Days of Remembrance themes, the, the themes that we've used for previous kind of commemora uh, commemorations are really resonant and often come with videos and poster sets that are really good for use in the classroom to cover various things. We did one on American Response a few years before we had the Americans and the Holocaust exhibition. So if you want a very quick poster set and um, video that you can use to explore some of these themes, you know, that's a really good place to go is to look in some of the um, poster sets that are available on our teach page and pull up um, things that you can print if you want kind of an exhibition in your classroom. Thanks, Christina. Um, so the next question that had come in was, there are countries, it's kind of similar. There are countries who are currently facing discrimination against a certain race, gender, or age. How could an individual in, or in America help prevent genocide or another Holocaust when the battle's in another country, such as Afghanistan or South America or even Africa? Thanks, Christina. Um, from my understanding, Americans didn't even know what, it, what was happening with the Holocaust until after World War II. So this question really gets at one of the enduring questions that we raise in the Americans in the Holocaust exhibition. Um, what is our role and responsibility in the world as individuals, as communities, as a country? And if you teach American history or if you get at some of these questions with your students, you know that Americans throughout history have debated this question. Um, in regards to the Holocaust, Americans actually did have quite a lot of information, um, particularly in the 1930s, about the Nazi Party's anti-Semitism, 
and the ways in which they were putting that anti-Semitism into practice um, with legal discrimination, with economic expulsion, with kicking Jews out of the civil service, boycotting Jewish owned businesses, burning books, um, taking Jews and, and taking their citizenship away. And my colleague Eric will talk about the museum's history unfolded project, which kind of illuminates a lot of the information that was available to Americans in the 1930s. And he'll talk about that in a little bit. But in terms of how we can prevent genocide abroad, you know, some of that I, I think I talked about already, but continuing to stay informed is really important. Um, donating or volunteering with NGOs working in some of these areas can also be really rewarding. And as I said, you know, a lot of elected officials think that their constituency is, is focused on domestic affairs. So letting them know that you care about genocide prevention, that genocide prevention is something that you value when you're looking about voting, when you're thinking about um, you know, the role that you want your representatives to play, that can be really, really important. Um, the next question that had come in, and again, any of my colleagues, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, the next question that had come in is I think a good one to crowdsource. Um, what is a good book to read that gives a summary of Holocaust events? I would like to start reading more about the events, but not be overwhelmed by a massive page number. I hear you. Um, my book, my um, computer is set up on two Holocaust books that are about this big, and it's only two of them. Holocaust books can be quite massive. Um, what's a good starter book to read? So the two I recommend, and I wonder what my colleagues, both in North Carolina and in DC think about this, is I really like Doris Bergen's War and Genocide, A Concise History of the Holocaust, which came out in 2016, um, and Peter Hayes's Why. Those are kind of my two go-to, if I'm only going to read one, those are the ones. Um, they're both pretty recent, they're really readable, they have a lot of the newest scholarship, they're pretty relatively short and accessible, you know, less than, 350 pages or so. Um, if you have other favorites, please feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself and, and stick up for your favorite. Um, but your favorite is probably not David Cesarani's The Final Solution, which is excellent, but is also um, 987 pages long. I just checked. So yes, a lot of them are very big. Those two, Peter Hayes's why, um, and <laughs> thank you, Lindsay. Lindsay has shouted out my book in the chat. Very nice. Thank you so much. Um, but Doris Bergen's War and Genocide, Peter Hayes's why. Um, why in particular is great with students. Uh, Peter Hayes was a, is now retired, but it was a professor at Northwestern for a really long time. And basically put his lecture notes for his Holocaust, Holocaust class into a one volume. And so, he talks about the role of the Catholic Church. He talks about the role of the international community. He talks about Nazi ideology and why the Jews were particularly targeted. Um, it's really answering all of these student questions of why. And so um, that's a really great one, especially if you know your students ask hard questions. Um, I, I think he's a great resource for that. And also our Holocaust Encyclopedia, also a great resource for that sort of thing. Um, thank you, Suzanne. Um, so the next question that was submitted in advance was what are the differences between Holocaust denial and distortion? How are these method methods dangerous for not only Jews, but non-Jews as well, as some may feel this is only a Jewish problem. So Holocaust denial is the idea that the Holocaust or some sort of proven aspect to it, like the murder of Jews using gas chambers, um, isn't true. Distortion, there's a lot of gray area between denial and distortion. Distortion is seeking to minimize what happened, saying it, it wasn't as bad as everybody says it was, trying to rehabilitate perpetrators. That's something you see, unfortunately, really often these days in Eastern Europe. Um, they're similar in that they are both based in anti-Semitism. So people who deny or distort are not interested in evidence. They are not interested in historical truth. That is one of the reasons that it's so difficult to argue against 
Holocaust deniers and disorders is that they are actually not interested in looking at the evidence that you provide. They're not interested in engaging in any sort of scholarly way. This is not a good faith argument. Um, they are pushing an anti-Semitic agenda. And denial and distortion are dangerous for a lot of the same reasons that anti-Semitism is, is dangerous. It creates divisions, it perpetrates hatreds, it can lead to violence um, and even genocide if unchecked. That's what we see in the Holocaust. So it is very much a problem for all of us um, Jews and non-Jews because it destabilizes society. The next question really um, kind of dovetails on that and, and I've combined the last two questions. So this is the last one I have that is submitted in advance. Um, so again, I encourage you to put questions in the chat and then we can also talk amongst ourselves with recommendations as we move forward. But um, the last question submitted in advance was what can teachers do and say to help students recognize Holocaust denial and distortion? This is a hugely important question. Um, are there resources even students could use to help them know and say, uh, know what to say or do if confronted with Holocaust denial and distortion? What specific resources does the museum offer to teachers and students on this subject? So. The museum actually has an encyclopedia article specifically about combating denial and distortion, which I will put in the chat. And also, since I'm still sharing my screen, which I forgot I was doing, um, put here. No. Yes, you can see my page. Come on. There we go. So there's a, there are a lot of different encyclopedia articles right now about Holocaust denial. Um, this is one, this is on the origins of Holocaust denial, but you can also see Holocaust denial and distortion here, which, which takes you to a series of different web videos, um, links, uh, encyclopedia articles, all about the question of denial and distortion, where it comes from, what the antecedents are, um, and a few kind of practical ways to combat it. Um, one of the things teachers can do is to include the history of anti-Semitism into your teaching about the Holocaust. I think one of the ways that we can combat Holocaust denial and distortion is to help students actually recognize it when they see it out in the world. Um, the museum has explainers on kind of why the Jews, why did the Nazis target Jews in a few different formats. In encyclopedia articles, there's a short video, there's a lesson plan. Um, and so recognizing these historical trends of anti-Semitism and, and the often contradictory stereotypes that anti-Semites use frequently um, can help students identify and dismiss those stereotypes or those accusations when they see them live. Um, I'll put a link to our lesson on Nazi anti-Semitism, particularly since that lesson plan includes a lot of links to resources that might be helpful. So I'll show that here and also, where did we go? Okay, can you still see my screen? What do you see right now? <laughs> I've closed the, okay, Holocaust uh -huh. Island distortion, right? Yes. Is that what you still see? Okay. All right, so here is um, a direct link. I, I put it in the chat. I didn't mean to direct message Vicky. Sorry, Vicky. Um, Vicky has submitted a question, which I'll get to in a second. So I'm sending it this now to everybody in the meeting. Um, this is the direct link to our lesson on anti-Semitism. You can see that it is available both um, as something that you can download and print. Um, it's also usable for learning management systems. So if you are using Schoology or one of the learning management systems, you can import this lesson into your LMS. Uh, you can also look at it online or assign students to look at it as part of review or, or something like that. And so you can see this is the online lesson that looks at the origins and history of anti-Semitism, how it has evolved over time, how racial anti-Semitism in Germany was different from religious anti-Semitism. And all of this helps students look at stereotypes, the idea of Jews as other, the idea of Jews as secretly undermining things. Those are persistent stereotypes, untrue stereotypes throughout the last 2000 years. And so that I think helps students identify this in the wild when they see it. And then immediately they can categorize it and dismiss it for what it is, which is anti-Semitic hatred. Um, so that I think is, is a really good um, way to combat it within your classroom uh, through education. Um, 
If you have already noticed Holocaust denial and, and distortion in your classroom, I will put one more link in the chat, which is to a YouTube video of an interview between my colleague Edna Friedberg and Derek Black. Um, Derek Black grew up in one of the leading white nationalist families in the US and, and famously renounced his uh, that ideology that he grew up with. And the video includes a little bit of background on Derek, um, but also, and I, I think this is crucial, his reflections on the factors that led him to denounce white nationalism, to denounce the anti-Semitism that he grew up with. Um, factors like holding respectful conversations, meaningfully engaging with others, um, looking at primary sources so that someone was not telling him he was discovering for himself um, what was happening. Uh, it is clearly not an easy thing to do to pull someone who is deeply into Holocaust denial or distortion out of that. Um, but Derek's experience really does show that change is, is possible. Um, so let me put that in. Yeah, Suzanne said, I think anti-Semitism can and should be taught in world history, which helps students understand the context when studying World War II. I think that's right. I think it's important that students understand that this isn't just Hitler's particular hatred that then he brainwashes everyone with, that this was something that had been in Europe and been in the, wor in the world for decades, for generations. And so they were able to pull on anti-Semitic tropes that already existed and expand on them and, and add a racial component to it um, that um, was very effective in Germany. Um, let's see. I'll do Vicky's question, which was, was there a, a trigger in Hitler's childhood or youth that caused his anti-Semitism? So there's been a lot of speculation from historians about what caused Hitler's anti-Semitism. And, and really we can't pinpoint any specific trigger. Um, so there, there is no one person, there is no one cause, there is no one moment where we can pinpoint events to. And I, I worry about any attempt to do that because that can lead towards victim blaming to me, that one person did something and then Hitler took this and then you know the Holocaust was a result. And I, do, I don't think it's that simple. I think it is a very complex, um, kind of miasma of his own personal hatreds and resentment in anti-Semitism and the world in which he grew up in and his resentment at the end of World War I and his desire to find some sort of scapegoat for that and his realization that the Jews were an easy one. And so I don't think that we can really pinpoint this on Hitler specifically, though he was certainly at the head of it, he is not the only one participating. He's not the one brainwashing anybody. He is pulling on a very deep well of hatred that existed and um, anti-Semitic feeling that existed throughout European society, not just German society. Um, but also, I, I think it's hard to, to pinpoint it to one particular incident. Um, so Karen commented that maybe Lee would like to share the, the, an incident that happened recently, and I'll let Lee decide whether he wants to. And I just, I just thought to show people that, I mean, it happens. It happens in Kinston, North Carolina, you know. Um, um, and Lee, if you don't feel comfortable, please don't. No, that's the one thing I was thinking of that I should have learned from is to be proactive and be ready. Uh, I know like Sue Ann's got a workshop coming up and I'm not saying assume you might hear an anti-Semitic remark, but be ready in the moment. Uh, to be able to answer them or, or, or at least give some sort of explanation back. I had a pastor call me today. Someone wanted to come see my Holocaust Center here. So I, I threw some clothes on, jumped in the car and, and went over there very excited. And I, I'm not saying they were a diehard denier and anti-Semite, but it was uh, everything I had, she questioned. And she was born in Germany, was from Mosburg and witnessed stuff, she said, as a, a seven and eight year old, uh, things that were done. And then she went off on a whole nother tangent about the evil American soldiers were doing there. Uh, and it just caught me off guard and I wish I'd been better prepared uh, for the day. And that's just my one word of advice is to be prepared. I mean, this is the challenge though, is that it's not always logical. You don't always know what people are going to come with. And you also don't always know whether people are operating in good faith. And so, as you said, this woman, 
it's hard to tell how hardcore denier she was. And so this may be something where this is an opportunity for education. And so I think it is really tricky for teachers to differentiate between this is an opportunity for education or this is a person who is using this moment as a platform for their own hatred and to spread their own hatred. And so to, to find that line and to create a safe space for all your students is something that is really challenging. Oh, I agree. And, and luckily she's local and I'm going to talk with her again and just maybe over time, we'll, we'll, yeah. it'll have a good result. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing that, that, I, that I have learned from Derek Black is that as, as much of a difficult onus it places on you, if the person seems willing to engage, it kind of is these small conversations and these, you know, willing to listen, even if you find the thing that the person is saying to be abhorrent to, you know, you are in a private space with her, this, this maybe is an educational opportunity, but it, it, it needs to be a place where you feel safe. And the article you recommended, was it, this is not the American way of war? Yeah. So before okay. we started, I recommended an article to Lee. I can send you the link to it. Um, but Thank it you. is a, a scholarly article um, called, this is not the American way of war. And it was about actual um, in Dachau, when American soldiers liberated, there were several atrocities committed in, in which against um, American regulations, American soldiers shot SS officers and shot guards and killed them. This, this was standard from many other armies, but it was not, quote, the American way of war. Americans did not tend to do that. This was against American regulation. Um, but the soldiers in question were so appalled by what they saw upon liberation um, that they decided to um, to seek justice um, or what they considered to be justice. And so this is an article kind of looking at this question of um, American atrocities at liberation and, and the role that American soldiers played in post-war Germany, um, which was very different from the role that Soviet soldiers played and, and that sort of thing. And so um, it is, you know, I think something that is worth looking at and and as as you and I talked about you know if you send me the kind of specifics of what she was saying sometimes it is stepping back from the person saying I'm going to go research this and then coming back with information that you two can look at together and talk about and so hopefully that's something that that we can work on together so that when you do work with her you can specifically address the concerns that she was saying I would also say um there's a really great website. I'm going to try to find it. Um, you're now all seeing my like search. Uh, it might be Holocaust denial on trial. So after the trial, after um, Deborah Lipstadt's trial with David Irving. Nope, that's not it. I will find it. I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen so that you're not seeing like random things now. Um, I will find the link and I will put it in this chat, but the, I think it's de it's denial on trial or something like that. Um, but the people who worked with Deborah Lipstadt in her defense in the David Irving trial when she was sued for libel for calling David Irving a Holocaust denial for calling her a hol calling him a Holocaust denial or denier. Um, the, the team put together a website with some of the most common things stated by Holocaust deniers and distorters. Um, and here is all the evidence against that particular statement. Yes, thanks, Steve Goldberg. I think that is the one that you're talking about. Thank you, David. Also, yes, that's what I was looking at. Thank you so much. Um, team effort. Um, I find that really useful. This is also something, I mean, students don't tend to come with things this detailed, but in case they do, or in case you encounter adults who have done their research in terms of Holocaust denial or um, fallen victim to some of these um, more common things about, you know, Anne Frank's diary being forged, 
about, you know, the gas chambers at Auschwitz not being real. You know, these are some of the, the very specific um, antidotes to that, factual antidotes. But again, you need to be aware that for many Holocaust deniers, the denial is the point, the anti-Semitism is the point, they're not going to be necessarily convinced by your facts. And that is one of the challenges in combating it. May I ask a question? Sure. Um, I am confronted so many times by teachers and principals um, and even friends of mine who say, if, if only the allies were nicer to the Germans after World War I, we wouldn't have had the Holocaust and Hitler wouldn't have had a platform. How do you respond to that in a concise, not simple, but a concise response to high school students or to individuals who pretty much will not listen for more than three or four minutes. And, and if I start talking about you're making apologies for Hitler and the Nazis, they dismiss that and say, but you're not really talking to the historical points that the allies were very bad to the Germans after World War I. No, I think that's a great point. Um, so the, the, the Treaty of Versailles um, and the fairly harsh um, punishment, so, quote unquote, of Germany after the Treaty of Versailles is something that historians are, are generally um, in agreement with. It was a very harsh um, end to the war. And so that, that is something that generally is not in question by historians, but does that absolve Germany of genocide? I would argue a strong no. There have been many wars in which um, the end of the war and the, the details of the peace um, have been quite punitive. And that country has not engaged in genocide within 30 years of that. Um, as, a, as a way of um, retribution. And so I think both can be true. The Germany can be guilty of, gen Germany and its collaborators can be guilty of genocide and the Treaty of Versailles can be overly punitive. Um, I think both of those things are right and both of those things are true, but one does not absolve of the other. And there is no reason to blame the allies. There are reasons to blame the allies for many things, um, but uh, causing Germany to commit genocide is not one of them. No one is, no one is forced to commit genocide. Any other questions you have for Dr. Rebelding? Um, yeah, I, I'd like to throw one out there that I, I get um, asked a lot by my students, and I just want to kind of make sure I'm, I'm giving the probably the best um, response, and that is um, what they ask me if, um, if the Nazis hadn't dedicated so many of their men to concentration camp guards and in the concentration camp system, um, you know, would they have been able to win World War II? Um, is, is it because they, like, put all of those resources there, that's why they lost. Um, so like strategically, I'm not sure exactly um, of the, the right way to approach that, um, but I was wondering if you could maybe answer that particular question. Oh, that's, I, I bet that there are long historian conversations about this one. Oh, that's a fascinating question. I don't know. I don't know the answer. Um, you know, it's clear at certain points that Germany is, especially in, in 1941 and 1942, murdering people that it could have used to assist them in the war effort. Um, it's, it's really in 1944 that they actually back off a little bit, just a little bit on mass murder so that they can um, try to prolong the war and use uh, forced labor in order to do so. Um, that's a really good question. What do your students think? Um, they're usually uh, split on, yeah. on their, their thoughts on it. Um, and um, they're one of the things I think that they're not really sure about is, okay, so which, what kind of um, men were assigned for the con to be concentration camp guards? Were those your, uh, your guys that they decided really weren't best at the front. Um, and so they became concentration camp guards or um, 
so that's that's part of the conversation that we have as well. Um, but again, I mean, I I don't know, and I don't know what the numbers were of how many um, how many guards there were overall yeah. in the massive system that was there. Um, so that's why it's a massive system, but they also pull in um, auxiliaries and, and mm -hmm. captured Soviet prisoners and, and lots of people to staff the camps with them. And so there are about 910,000 members of the SS. Some of them are on the front. Some of them are staffing concentration camps. Um, I don't think the, the sheer number of staff of concentration camps and killing centers is so large to offset, you know, victory in the Soviet zone, for example. Um, I think the places that that it could have made a difference is in the economic situation where they're using people for prisoner labor and to build weapons where they're not. Um, but also, I mean, you are looking at the the might of the United States, the might of the Soviet Union. And even though we are fighting an all out war in the United States, we are largely fighting it. This is a controversial statement, but with with half a hand tied behind our backs. We are not invaded. Um, we are still, we, you know, 12% of the American um, populace serves in uniform during the war. So a massive effort, but not an all encompassing effort. Had we been invaded, had this been a us or them sort of fight, I think it, it would have been different and probably would have been the same outcome, but a prolonged one. Um, Lee asked, where were the guards from, not just Germany? Um, so the original guards were from Germany, you know, in the early years of the camp system, the camps were all in Germany, that was the territory that they held. Um, as they expanded, they moved many camps in this, and particularly the killing centers outside of um, German, pre-war German territory um, into uh, Eastern Europe, into Nazi-occupied Poland and Nazi-occupied Soviet Union. Um, they pulled auxiliaries in. Uh, largely um, Soviet POWs or Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians who were willing to sign up for the SS in exchange for not having to serve on the front. And those people um, offered, I don't know why my lights are flickering, offered <laughs> to serve in, um, it, in the SS uh, and in the camp system in exchange for not having to serve on the front. So still full participants in, in mass killing and still um, definitely perpetrators, but not people who were born in Germany. Um, Steve Goldberg cautions people um, to look up or to to be careful about looking at uh, the question of Elie Wiesel's tattoo number. Um, I ran into this too as we were working on the lesson plan that we um, created about teaching night. And when you, Elie Wiesel famously did not share images of his tattoo. He, um, he showed students, there's a lot of evidence and testimony from his students that he would show them on request, but he was not photographed with his tattoo. Um, and that has led to deniers claiming that he didn't have one, that this was all made up. Um, that is the denier website that Steve linked to in the chat um, is, is um, theorizing that he actually did not have one. This is untrue. There's tons of evidence from his students. Um, that he taught over the years and from people who saw him in give lectures where he showed his tattoo, but he just did not allow himself to be photographed with it. So but there's no that. reason to suspect that he did not have one. Um, I was just struck, I happened to look it up and it's a really evil, well done website. website. Yeah. Yeah. And they have gone deep into trying to debunk him. Um, they found photographs that I had never seen before. I, you know, I explored that website too, just because I wanted to be sure that we were, um, that anything that we found or that we used was not something that was also used by that website by accident in case they had shared something out that we were then pulling in or that, you know, they were starting to set, to, um, set up a story that we weren't properly debunking with our resources. And so that, that's a website that I looked at a lot, unfortunately. Um, and then it's it's a very gross website. You don't have to click on that link. Um, but there is an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that that Elie Wiesel faked um, or did not actually have a, a tattoo from Auschwitz. Okay. Well, we could keep talking <laughs> because um, I, I just don't know how much 
I, it's, it's hard to fathom how much knowledge Dr. Abounding has in her head. <laughs> I love this. I always learn something new. Um, we appreciate so much you coming um, to chat. And if they have any other questions, maybe that come up and, and I'll send them to you or, or share them with you. Um, yes, please do. Be great. Um, Dr. Belding, thank you so much, very much for, for being a part of this. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Yes, we, um, it, it, all of the resources that you shared, we're really excited. Um, I'm excited to go explore and, and see what we can do with, with other programs. So we're gonna kind of transition here with Eric Schmalt, who is also working with the museum with the History Unfolded project. And he has um, a lot of information to share with us. And, um, if you haven't explored and tried out the History Unfolded project, you really need to do that. So we're really excited to have Eric come and share with us. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. I'm gonna give you a little introduction to the History Unfolded US newspapers in the Holocaust website. I'm gonna try quickly to go through a lot of aspects of the site and how you can use it. Uh, and also show you a, a sample, how to upload an article as well. Okay, so hopefully I'm gonna drop the link to the website as well in the chat. Uh, this is what we're calling a citizen history project at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, and History Unfolded is an effort now that's entering uh, its seventh year. So we've been running this for six uh, years come November in which we are inviting students around the country to see how their local newspapers reported on different events of the Holocaust. The project has three main components to it, learn, research, and contribute. And we have over 40 different event topics for research. Uh, and some of them specifically relate to the Holocaust in Europe, but some also provide historical context about what is happening in the United States at the time. Uh, as uh, Dr. Belding talked about, uh, we have an ongoing initiative at the Museum on Americans and the Holocaust. And we tried really hard to help students and visitors to the special exhibition and the initiative as a whole to uh, you know, not uh, read history forward, but to try to understand some of the pressures and the context and uh, the different factors that would have influenced Americans either willingness or lack of willingness to support uh, refugees abroad and try to end the Holocaust. Uh, and so the different uh, topics, for instance, this one on Nazi boycott Jewish businesses provide keywords to assist uh, volunteers, especially our citizen historians who are doing online research. We have uh, several paragraphs of background text because uh, we know that, uh, and I've seen in the chat, you know, there are teachers talking about how do you teach this in a U.S. history course or in world history, how do you teach the Holocaust? Uh, we've had school groups teach history unfolded uh, or use history unfolded in world history, U.S. history, English, journalism, um, you know, psychology courses or many different options. And then dates to check. And this is where uh, we are encouraging uh, our volunteers to hone in on their research because we really want to help understand what Americans could have known at the time by looking at their local newspapers. The next uh, part of the website experience is to actually research the newspapers. This is done in two ways primarily. Uh, in microfilm research done in libraries and archives and historical societies, uh, and also through online newspaper collections. Um, especially due to the pandemic, the vast majority of our research has been online. Um, if you can safely get students into a library, it is often, from what we've heard back, been a very rewarding experience for students to be able to look at microfilm. It's hands on, it's engaging. Students are not only learning about the specific coverage of these events, but they're also learning about the, the context again, what else is going on at the time. And then the third part is contribute, in which we're actually asking our volunteers to submit the data uh, to the site. Um, I forgot to mention on the research component, uh, we do provide 
uh, a directory of known newspaper archives throughout the United States. So you could, for instance, go and look to see what newspapers we know of available in North Carolina. And you'll see we had 10 results. This is just a starting point. Uh, we highly encourage uh, all teachers and other educators to work with local librarians, uh, university librarians, public librarians, uh, to find out what newspapers you have access to on the ground. Uh, and so one really fantastic resource, uh, I will say, North Carolina teachers are really fortunate to have North Carolina newspapers, Digital NC. Um, this provides a wealth of online free local newspapers uh, throughout North Carolina. Uh, and it's even divided by uh, student newspapers, African American papers, and community papers. And then I mentioned before that the third part of the website experience is contribute in which we invite our uh, citizen historians to uh, submit what they find to the History Unfolded database. So I'm very quickly going to uh, walk you through uh, this process now that we have uh, the, the three parts of the assignment. Um, if you were to start from beginning to end as an educator working with students, you would have them create a History Unfolded account. Uh, it's free to create an account. There is a confirmation email they need to click to confirm. Uh, some teachers do have an issue where the uh, school firewall prevents them from doing so. So you may want to test that out. Uh, once uh, students have created an account, uh, they will either select the event themselves or you can also uh, you know, assign particular events to students. Uh, so you may have an individual student working on an event, you may give a student choice, you may have students work in groups, all of those are variable options. Uh, and so I'm going to get the example today of let's say you have a student group looking at this topic on the German American Boone rally in uh, Madison Square Garden on February 20th, 1939. Uh, and so in this particular case, uh, we have the keywords that you'll be using to do the research. Let's go ahead and use the uh, North Carolina newspapers uh, archive that I mentioned before, and you can use some of those keywords. And so I'm going to go ahead and start trying uh, a few of them. And I'm going to put in, oops, sorry, put in Madison Square Garden. That's some of the keywords. Uh, listed in the event module and see if anything comes up. And you'll see we have a handful of articles. There's one from the Daily Tar Heel of uh, Chapel Hill to the student newspaper of the University of North Carolina. And to me, this is really interesting. If I were, you know, had more time and read through it all, uh, you will see that this is an editorial uh, by the paper talking about this uh, rally in Madison Square Garden and some of the reactions, uh, the response from the American Jewish Committee, uh, and this whole discussion about the limits of free speech. And so it's a really, really fascinating story. The other thing I love about this particular piece, uh, we do already have it in History Unfolded, it was submitted by someone who worked for the Tar Heel, oops, the Tar Heel, um, when that person submitted it. So it was the actual Tar Heel uh, editor, I believe, uh, someone from the staff paper who submitted the, the newspaper article from the, the same, um, or editorial from the same paper. And then you would uh, be logged in and you would do two things. Uh, first, you should check to make sure that the submission is new to the database. Go to Menu, Explore User Research, and then you can search either by the event uh, or you can search by the newspaper name or the state. I would recommend by the newspaper name or state because there are some cases in which a particular piece might actually span multiple events and we can only approve a submission to a single event. So I'm going to try the um, Daily Tar Heel and, and search the database ahead of time to see whether the article is history unfolded. And you'll see that the results are in chronological order. So I'm looking for 1939. And uh, this, in fact, is already in History Unfolded. 
Um, I chose one that we already had, but let's say you did not see it here. You saw November 18th, 1938, and you saw March 4th, 1939. So you could go ahead and submit that piece. And then in the History Unfolded um, website, there are several ways you can submit. You would go to My Profile and Submit Research or Menu and Submit Research. You go from the Event Module page and Submit Research. And then you would follow these steps on the submission process. Uh, and you would enter in all the information. So the newspaper name, the location, and then you would enter in uh, the, the metadata. This is what we're really interested in collecting as a whole for the History Unfolded database. So you put in editorial, put in the page number, the date, the headline, and if there's a listed author or uh, a wire service, you put that in there. Upload an image associated uh, with the particular piece. And then you would verify all of your information and uh, hit submit. And so we try really hard to give students a response within uh, a week. If we're doing very well and it's not the busiest time of the semester, maybe even within 48 hours. And we provide each uh, student contributor with individual feedback from one of our submissions reviewers. And so they will let the student know whether the article has been approved into the database. Uh, and if not, what they can do to edit it, if it just needs changes or if it's outside the scope of one of those events, why it's not being approved. And we find that it's very motivating for a lot of students to know that there are real human beings on the back end that are valuing their work um, as well. And um, the other thing I will mention about that, you know, value of the work is the museum has been using this research to support our Americans in the Holocaust exhibition. Uh, we have newspaper articles that appear on an interactive wall map in the physical space, as well as uh, some quotations from uh, letters to the editor on the, the walls of the exhibition as well. Articles have been curated and used in the traveling version of American the Holocaust, which is traveling um, all over the, the country in various libraries now. Uh, and some of our programs, such as uh, Facebook Live, uh, and, and other resources at the museum. So I have heard from a number of teachers that say one of the real motivating aspects of this project is that students understand that this is not busy work, their work is being used, and that's very exciting for them. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, now talk about some specific teacher resources, uh, and then I will wrap up. Uh, so there is the menu and teacher resources page under more links. This is a great resource. Um, I'll just mention that we're in the phase of the project where we're actively trying to collect as much research as we can. Uh, we have recently uh, collected uh, 50,000 total submissions since we started in the last six years. Uh, so that's a, an incredible milestone and we wanna get as much as we can from North Carolina and other states. But I'm a former classroom teacher, and I know in the chat there's already been discussion, how do you teach something like world history or even US history where you only have maybe several days to a week on the Holocaust? So I am very aware of the fact that not all of you will necessarily have time to do this project in full. So we have provided lesson plans uh, where you could have students look at some of the material we've already um, approved. And so we have the main plan which is how to submit research. We also have other lesson plans, which is looking at some of the data we've already collected. So there's this bilingual lesson plan on Spanish language newspaper coverage of the Holocaust. The lesson plan is fully bilingual. Um, we have one on the Black press and uh, how, the, how some Black press newspapers report in the Holocaust and one on use responses to the Holocaust. If students submitting uh, research to history unfolded or in general if you just want to teach them how to read old newspapers this particular guide is fantastic uh, it shows students how to read newspapers from the 30s and 40s so really really good resource uh, the other thing let me get out of here uh, that i would recommend is if you go back to the main website 
or sorry, the history unfolded websites menu and resource center. There are resources, particularly for teachers and also general research. Uh, some of our, our video tutorials, so I would recommend in group for your students. This uh, show you through a screencast I did how to create groups and how to manage them as the leader. We also um, have tutorials about helping students to identify bylines, how to make sure they're adding um, new research. And the final thing, which is very exciting, we're working more and more towards this, is eventually we're gonna be in phase two of the project in which we are um, really trying to optimize the website for the display of the material. And we're kind of sort of in a phase 1.5 right now where some of the material is immediately ready for classroom use. So if you go to that menu and explore user research, page, and I'm actually gonna drop this one in the chat because I think in addition to the um, teacher resources page, uh, this will be really useful to you. I'm very excited about this. And so there are a growing number of articles available for download. So we have over a thousand articles um, in various states in which you can actually download the full image. I will caveat this, that the image quality is whatever the uh, citizen historian sent us originally. So in some cases, it's a high resolution full page. In other cases, it's a clipping. Um, it may not be the entire article, but that's at least a good starting point. If you want ready to use primary sources in your classroom. We also have articles um, embedded from newspapers.com, many of them which are immediately readable. Uh, you have over 20,000 articles to choose among, and you could filter, for instance, by the state of North Carolina. And uh, you can see you have almost 400 uh, articles. So here's one from the Asheville Citizen Times about um, an American citizen uh, being attacked in March of 1933. So you could come up with some really interesting lesson activities with students uh, with that. And then going back to that menu, explore user research, we've also uh, provided the ability to filter by black press newspapers, Jewish newspapers, Spanish language newspapers, or college newspapers. Um, I know that was a really quick overview. Um, I am the community manager at Time Project. So I really encourage educators to reach out to me with questions or something you're interested in and you uh, want to work on. Um, I'll provide my email in the chat as well. Uh, and we also have um, David Clevin um, on the, the conference call tonight. He's the education lead on the project. Some of you may have already worked with him. We work together regularly. So you could contact either one of us and we'd be more than happy to assist you in whatever way is useful. Uh, so unless anyone else has anything to add, um, I do want to be mindful of time. So questions, you, I think we have a, a quick question for Eric and he's great. He's very easy to contact and he responds very quickly. So um, please don't don't hesitate in, in getting in touch with him. Um, it's a great project. And even, even if you're not able to find newspapers uh, and, and to do that research part, there's so many <laughs> articles up there um, and for our state as well. So it's really interesting um, because so many of our kids don't, don't know how to read a newspaper. They never really have done that. And so um, I, I think it's, it's great. Chris, you said you um, are phenomenal. Good, lots of positive feedback, very good. Um, any questions for Eric? Eric, thank you so much for coming and for sharing these resources. Um, they're, they're just, we're just so blessed that, that we have the museum to help us and have created all of these things for us to use. So we're very um, appreciative of you taking your time out to, to share with us. So if you have any questions, you think about it, you could contact Tim or certainly Lori and I could, could be that person to help as well. Um, Christina is gonna talk with us uh, briefly about the uh, Never Again Education Act and what that's involving and, and all the work that the museum's been doing with that. 
Right. Thanks, Karen. Um, so I'm going to keep this very brief because we we want to make sure that we have the most time um, to listen to testimony of somebody who went through the Holocaust from Sully. So I'm going to try to do this in five minutes, hopefully. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Never Again Education Act, uh, this was a piece of bipartisan um, legislation that provides $2 million a year to provide Holocaust education widely throughout the United States um, that was entrusted to the museum um, in working with our Czech partner. So I'm gonna show you just very quickly a very brief um, PowerPoint here. Can you all see my screen? Can everybody see it? Yes? I don't know. I'm not yes, getting yes, it. yes, I can. All right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. I was trying to say it. Okay. So just very quickly, um, this was signed into law in May of 2020, at the end of May, I think it was like May 28th. Um, so this requires a museum to develop and disseminate accurate, relevant, and accessible resources to improve awareness and understanding of the Holocaust. The Never Again Education Act authorizes various Holocaust education program activities to, and I have to move this around here because I cannot see my whole screen, to engage prospective and current teachers and educational leaders. Um, so to achieve these goals, the museum staff in the Levine Institute and the Levine Institute and more specifically education initiatives is the branch that David and Becky and I belong to. And Eric is also part of the Levine Institute as well. Um, so how does this affect you in North Carolina? Um, so we will be working or we hope to, we, we plan to reach all 50 states, especially underserved, under-resourced communities in the 50 states and understanding that there are vast differences among the states and that different, there are different standards, different requirements to be taught um, according to each state. Um, and the way that we're going to reach out to these under-resourced areas is by working with partners like the North Carolina Council. Um, we've already been working with the council really for several years, even before the Czech program, even, more, even before they became one of our Czech partners. Um, but this is going to intensify our work together. Um, and not only are we going to work with our Czech partners, but we will be working with state departments of education. David is doing that. He's heading the effort to work with curriculum and instruction specialists, curriculum coordinators, um, at district and especially at the state level with the state departments of education. Um, and we also want to use the funds through the Never Again Education Act to evaluate the work that we are doing and evaluate some of the resources that we are producing. So very quickly, um, some of the strategies that we've identified as being of top importance is to translate our resources into Spanish. Spanish is the second most spoken language here in the United States. You probably, um, many classrooms as we know are very, they've become much more diverse. And there is a large number of Spanish speakers, um, not only in the classrooms, but also through our visitorship and sometimes even in our programs. So um, we do have a very robust Holocaust Encyclopedia translation project where you can find a lot of articles in Spanish. But what we want to do is also translate our lesson plans that we've already created. Eric mentioned one of them, which we use Spanish language newspapers from History Unfolded. Um, also, too, we have we are working with Vanderbilt University to modify um, our lessons to meet the various needs of, of students that have different needs. Um, and you can find some of those already on our website, those modifications and that we will continue to do. Um, and also very important, and our North Carolina Czech partners are helping us do this, is to distribute print resources. Um, so right now we are working with an organization called First Book. You might be familiar with them. Some of you might have been registered with them already, and some of you might have received 
information from Karen to register with First Book um, because through the funding through the Never Again Education Act, we are providing um, First Book, working with First Book, we are providing uh, classroom sets of nights or the diary of, an, of a young girl, which is of course Anne Frank's diary. Um, because we recognize that not every classroom has internet access and that not every student in the United States has access to technology at home. They may not have um, laptops, uh, tablets, they may not have Wi-Fi. Um, and this is something that our check partners like the North Carolina Council helped us to identify as a great need, the need for print books, print materials. Um, but with that, we also recognize, as, as um, we talked about earlier, the need for professional development. So it's not only about putting books into the hands of those who need them, but it's also ensuring that teachers know how to teach night and the diary of a young girl. Um, and the priority is to classrooms where at least 70% of the students are um, low income. Um, and right now, this is the first phase of the Never Again Education Act right now in which we are working to provide class sets of books and offer professional development on how to use those books in the classroom. Um, so, and this is where David's work is, is really critical. We are piloting, um, we are piloting this program right now where we are working with curriculum coordinators from four states, one of them being North Carolina um, to build on our relationship. Um, this summer, when we hosted the Belfer National Conference, we had a third section of the conference, which we called Belfer Three. And our focus was to reach curriculum coordinators, um, curriculum and instruction specialists at the state level, but also at the district level as well. And that is something that we will continue to work on. So our work with the North Carolina Council is going to continue uh, after tonight. This is just really the first touch as check partners, but now we wanna move forward through the Never Again Education Act. Um, and then we want to evaluate, as I mentioned earlier, um, some of the, the funding will go toward evaluation of our materials. And we have lesson plans and resources that address anti-Semitism. So we would like to evaluate the effectiveness of those. Um, some of you asked Dr. Belding about Holocaust denial, which is a form of anti-Semitism. And you know, perhaps that will be one of the, the um, themes that we will evaluate the effectiveness of the tools and the encyclopedia articles that we've presented to you tonight. Um, and also we want to look at the relevance. Um, how do we address relevancy um, of the Holocaust? And of course that goes back to what I mentioned earlier, every state, every classroom, every community has a different way of identifying what relevance is. And we want to bottom line, make sure that whatever we produce, that it is accessible, accessible on our website, that there is no uh, cost uh, prohibition toward using our resources, that they are in various languages, that they meet particular needs of, of students. Um, so just very quickly, um, some of the goals that we've identified. We want to make sure that more teachers are teaching about the Holocaust, and we want to increase that reach. And working with our North Carolina partners, um, that will certainly help us do that in North Carolina. And we also want to make sure that there are more opportunities for teachers across the country to access quality Holocaust educational opportunities like what we are doing this evening. So this is why we will continue to work with the North Carolina Council um, through the Never Again Education Act of the next five years, but even after the next five years, we hope to put into place um, these programs and these strategies that will be ongoing even after the five-year period is over. So um, just as a review, we will continue to work with professional, work on professional development, um, and we will continue to work with teachers. You are certainly really our first touch and one of our most important audiences. Um, and we will do so through our check partners, through curriculum coordinators, and making sure that teachers have the resources 
to teach about this. So um, I'm not going to go any further. Um, this part talks about first book, but I do want to um, add that if you have any questions about receiving the class sets of books, you can contact myself or you can contact Karen. Um, Karen, I believe you sent an email for teachers to register with first book. Yes, we send it out. Okay, fantastic. So if you, if you haven't seen that email, check your inboxes, check your spam box, perhaps it went there. And if you can't find it there, just reach out to us, to Karen and to myself. So um, I, I know I went through this very quickly, um, but again, the North Carolina Council is really key to helping ensure, working with us to help ensure the success of the Never Again Education Act. Um, so expect to hear more from us um, and from myself and from David and the rest of our team in education initiatives at the museum. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And, and again, put any questions you might have in the chat. And if we don't get to them tonight, then we'll certainly get those to Christina. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn this part of the program over to the, um, well, to Lori Semmel. Did I say that right, Lori? You did. Thank you. Good, good. Um, and we're going to stop recording at this point because we're